So the topic of today's presentation is rote teaching, which has been a somewhat controversial topic in piano teaching over the years. Often there are two sides that form, the rote teachers and the reading teachers. Although we have noticed that rote teaching has gained legitimacy in recent years, there is still some resistance to the idea of teaching by rote, usually because we earnestly desire students to become musically literate and we spend much time in lessons teaching students to read music. While it is true that teaching students to read needs to be a primary focus of a student's music education. We have found that rote teaching, when applied in specific ways, enhances a student's music education. Today, we hope to clarify what is meant by rote teaching and explore a new paradigm for rote teaching, one that will enhance rather than hinder a student's overall musicianship and their music literacy. If we, had, if we could see you all, we would ask you how many of you teach some by rote, and I'm sure quite a number of you do, but it's always good to go back and review why we do that. Um, if you have questions or comments as we go along, as Catherine mentioned, please drop them in the chat or the Q&A, and we will have some time for that at the end. So let's dive into this topic. I'd like you to pretend that you are a six-year-old and you're going to your very first lesson. What would you expect? You would expect to play pieces that sound like real music, to have fun, and to be able to walk up to the piano and play a great sounding piece like this. <laughs> Instead, what if you were a six-year-old and you went to your first lesson and this is what you got? This is a quarter note. It gets one beat. This is a half note. It gets two beats. This is a whole note. It gets four beats. These are your finger numbers. One, two, three, four, five, starting counting from your thumb. This is C, D, E on the piano. This is a treble clef sign. This is a bass clef sign. This is what middle C looks like in the right hand and in the left hand. Now let's play a song on C. C, 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 C. Isn't that fun? So um, in, the student wants music at the piano, but sometimes we are trained to give them theory on the page. So learning the rhythmic values, finger numbers, notes, and letter names is of course crucial but should it really be the focus of the very first lesson? Might it not be better to harness the student's enthusiasm by starting with a musical experience at the piano? There is a wide gulf between what the student can play and what the student can read. Both are important, so it's just a matter of what we start with with the student at the piano. To show you how this works, I would like to share one of the activities that Catherine and I do at the very first piano lesson. So we have a, a decorating piano decorating kit where students learn to decorate the piano. So they put uh, zebra triangles on the groups of two black keys. I'll put mine here. And then we have giraffe rectangles that go across the groups of three black keys. And then we like to start with um, the music alphabet starting on D because that's the easiest key to find. It's right between the two black keys where the zebra triangle is pointing. So I'll put my D on the D and they decorate the whole, all the octaves. And then we proceed with the other letters in the musical alphabet, C and E, etc. So the piano ends up beautifully decorated like this. And I've had so many parents want to take a picture of the piano after it's decorated. So this is just a really fun activity to introduce the music alphabet and the layout of the keyboard. So after that, um, students apply their knowledge by playing Alphabet Boogie, a piece that uses every single white key on the piano. So we have found that students, young and old, love the accomplishment they feel when they can play a great piece with accompaniment right away at their first encounter with the piano. Since this piece uses all the white keys, we ask students to stand, children to stand at the piano so that they can stay aligned behind the pro proper octave as they go from the bottom to the top of the piano. So in case you haven't heard Alphabet Boogie before, I'll just play a little bit of it. 
The student is playing with finger two only with the hand and a loose fist so they can have a good forearm motion. And they start down and we say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then the teacher joins with the accompaniment. to the top of the piano. So children believe that what they play matters more than what they can read. If we adapt our first lessons to this expectation, we will get children that look like this, which is Katie's little son when he was young. <laughs> he had such a big grin at the piano. We want students to race out of the lesson excited, saying, piano is so fun, I can't wait to go back next week. Look what I can play. When Julie and I began writing Piano Safari, we knew we wanted to use an intervallic reading approach. I'll briefly explore the reasons for this later in the presentation. We decided to include a few rote pieces alongside the intervallic reading pieces to keep things interesting and to keep the child motivated and happy throughout their elementary stage of piano. What we discovered was a world of musicality a whole new realm of teaching children not only to be able to read music, which is visual music literacy, but to be able to understand how music is constructed, to intuitively become rhythmic pianists, and to gain the skills necessary to manipulate musical ideas to create their own music. We believe that both visual and aural music literacy are necessary to produce truly musically literate pianists. So as we mentioned before, we realized that the word rote has developed a somewhat controversial reputation in the piano teaching world. We believe this has come about for two reasons. First, Noah Webster, the author of the first American dictionary. Noah Webster is actually a very interesting person. He was a man of organization and lists, and he actually, um, or Julie's house is near his historic home in Connecticut. But unfortunately, his dictionary definitions of the word rote are as follows. The use of memory, usually with little intelligence, and mechanical and unthinking routine or repetition. No wonder no one likes this word, and this is certainly not what we want our piano students to be like. The word rote has developed a poor reputation because of these definitions, but also because we have most likely all run across transfer students who have poor reading skills, and then we come to find out they've been taught entirely by rote. Today we're going to examine four questions to start us thinking about the topic of rote teaching. The first question is, what do we mean by rote teaching at the piano? Our definition of the word rote is the systematic introduction of musical and artistic concepts that are best introduced by modeling rather than from the notated score. Music is an aural art and it transcends notation. As Francis Clark, author of the Music Tree Method said, sound should come before symbol. Rote teaching is a way to help students experience a concept in sound and technical feel before they're introduced to its notation. This is similar to language acquisition. Children hear English or their native language from the time they're babies. They're read to by their parents from books that are much too hard for them to read, but which they can easily understand. They see the words, but cannot yet read them. And at the same time, they're learning the basics of the alphabet and how letters are put together to form words and sentences Eventually, they're able to read anything as their visual literacy catches up uh, to their oral literacy. This very same process works for reading music. Students hear complicated music from the time they're babies, and then we teach them pieces by rote that are initially too hard for them to read, but which they can easily play and with patterns they clearly understand. And at the same time, they're able to work on their reading basics. Gradually, their reading level catches up with their playing level. Can you imagine if we told children, you're not allowed to look at any book unless you can read all the words? 
And yet that is sometimes how we teach music. You're not allowed to play these pieces until you can read all the notes by yourself. We believe that rote teaching has a vital role in music language acquisition. If used correctly, it greatly aids in producing musically literate students. One of the goals as piano pedagogues that we have is to begin to change mindsets to a new paradigm that highlights the best purposes and best practices regarding rote teaching. Our new paradigm for rote teaching includes the following concepts. Rote teaching is for beginners. Since children are capable of understanding and playing much more complicated music than they can read, rote teaching is ideally suited for beginners while they are also laying the foundation for reading skills that they need to master. Rote pieces should be based on keyboard patterns that are easy to understand and remember by beginners who have no theory background. I'll explain this in a minute. Rote pieces are at the student's playing level, which is considerably above their reading level and rote teaching should be paired with reading instruction. Sh students should learn rote pieces alongside a separate body of reading pieces. We want to emphasize that not every piece makes a good rote piece. We believe that good rote pieces are ones that are based on keyboard patterns that children can easily understand. If you ask a, a small child to go to the piano and play something, they will often play chromatic patterns because that makes sense to them on the keyboard, how it's laid out. So chromatic part patterns are a great um, way to build rope pieces for young children, or uh, patterns of black and white key groups also make good rope pieces. Teaching a piece that does not fit this definition of a good rope piece may end in frustration or be counterproductive. So here is a good rope piece, I Like Bananas, and we showed you a video of this at the beginning of our presentation. So there is no way that a beginner could learn that to could read this piece because it's in D flat major has complicated syncopation and yet the keyboard pattern is actually really simple. Here's a little card that demonstrates the pattern. It goes white, black, black, white, black, and then you move up and play that same pattern. White, black, black, white, black, and the pattern continues on the white keys and then three black notes. And it keeps going white, black, black, white, black, white, black, black, white, black. Yum, yum, yum. So we've had students as young as four or five learn this very complicated rhythmic um, piece very early in their piano study because they've heard all these syncopated rhythms since they were babies. So, um, In contrast, I want to show you uh, what we would term a bad rope piece. Oh, oh, wait, I forgot about this one. This is one of the best parts of I Like Bananas is that you can change the words, which are I like bananas just like a monkey out for different animals and food like I like spaghetti just like a panda or I like potatoes just like a turtle. So that's a fun way to get students to repeat the piece over and over again. They think that's great fun. So now for our not good rope piece, and um, we chose this because we're pretty sure that no, none of you have taught this piece before since it's from an obscure 19th century piano method, um, and it sounds like this. seem very simple to learn by rote to a trained musician because it has a simple melody that goes up and down and beginning and ending on tonic. The left hand harmonizes with the right hand based on tom tonic and dominant, but to a child who is just beginning piano and does not know about tonic, dominant, seconds, thirds, note names, etc. What the child was, would experience in trying to learn this piece by rote is a sea of never ending white keys, having to remember which finger comes next, how many times to play each right hand note, which finger in the right hand comes with which finger in the left hand. There is no discernible pattern the child can hang on to since the counterpoint only makes sense if you know something about theory. Add to this that this piece is not exciting at all. This is not a good rope piece. It does not have any patterns that are easily discernible to the beginning student. 
reviewing our new paradigm for rote teaching. Rote teaching is for beginners. It's based on keyboard patterns that are easy to understand and remember with students who don't have a theory background. They're at a student's playing level, which is much more difficult than their reading level. And instruction by rote must be paired with systematic and thorough instruction in reading notation. Students have rote pieces they learn by modeling the teacher, and they have reading pieces to work specifically on their reading skills. You wouldn't teach a piece by rote and then have a beginning student try to read it. We use different pieces to develop different skill sets. And now for what rote teaching is not. Rote teaching is not for advanced students for whom it would be easier just to read the score. It's not copying without understanding. Sorry, Noah Webster, we don't agree with your definition. <laughs> Rote teaching is not done using any piece. Not every piece is a good rote piece. And it is not a replacement for reading. The word rote has developed its poor reputation because reading has often been delayed for much too long rather than rote and reading being taught in conjunction. So going back to our four questions about rote teaching, we already discussed the first question of what we mean by rote teaching and we talked about our definition. So now let's explore the second question. Is poor reading the result of teaching by rote? And we'd say not necessarily. It could be a matter of how the reading is taught. Although our topic today is rote teaching, we are now going to take a short bunny trail into the subject of reading. Reading music is complicated, more so than reading words. When reading words, a child needs to master, if in English, 26 letters, reading from left to right, combinations of letters and how the letters form words and sentences, and then fluency to put letters, words, and sentences together to form meaning. Now, by contrast, reading music has 88 keys and their relationship to the staff on the piano. Um, they don't read just one note at a time, but many notes at once. Um, you have to read left to right, as well as up and down. Read in rhythm, in real time. Then you have to translate the notation to a physical motion. And not to mention things like phrasing, dynamics, pedal, and all of those artistic things that make the music come alive. So when we consider how to teach reading music to students, there are four steps that can aid us in thinking about this huge topic. Step one is just to understand how great sight readers read. And we want to emphasize that note names are not enough. Um, as you would see here in this Clementi Sonatina, a student playing this piece would not constantly have letter names running through their head. Instead, great sight readers see intervals, chord shapes, and common patterns, such as the scales and the Alberti bass patterns that you see here, um, layered on top of the notes. So our eyes group notes together in common technical patterns and in common groups. So great sight readers are able to recognize intervals and chord shapes, identify patterns like scales and accompaniment patterns, understand rhythm at the macro and the micro levels, connect the visual with the aural, instantly recognize note names and their relationship to the keyboard, and then have the technique to execute what's read. So once we understand how great sight readers read, we can move to the second step and choose a reading approach. Methods are generally divided into four reading approaches including middle C, where all of the notes in the piece are oriented around middle C, a multi-key, which is basically um, pentascale positions in the beginning, so students are playing in a locked position in their right and left hand, um, the intervallic approach, which deals with the relationship between two notes, and finally the eclectic approach, which is basically a blend of the above approaches. Our step three to great reading is to provide systematic instruction in reading using your chosen reading approach. And we think you should believe in your approach and teach it wholeheartedly. Switching back and forth between approaches could confuse the student. And finally, 
It takes a long time to become an excellent sight reader for most people. We found that it takes at least three solid years of instruction before students begin to become fluent in their music reading. We've found time and time again that students bloom around age nine because at this age, they seem to have the cognitive ability to handle all of those reading tasks that contribute to fluent music reading. If you think about it, in school, students who receive daily instruction in reading beginning in kindergarten, around age five, are expected to be reading a grade level by third grade. So this is at least four solid years of daily training in reading words. So we can't expect children to become fluent music readers overnight, especially when we only see our students briefly once a week. It can take a long time, so persevere. Our bunny trail into reading shows us that teaching by rote is not necessarily the cause of poor reading skills. Teaching reading requires specific decisions and commitment by the teacher that are separate from teaching by rote. This leads us to our third question about rote teaching. Why is it assumed that we have to teach only by reading or only by rote? We don't. The best results come from a teaching, from teaching a combination of patterned rote pieces, which develop aural music literacy, alongside teaching reading pieces and sight reading cards, which develop visual music literacy. Students only taught by rote may always be handicapped in their ability to read, but students only taught by reading may never fully develop their oral abilities and creativity. What is the purpose of a piano method? We can take our example of learning language. If you were learning, wanting to learn Greek and you bought a Greek grammar text, you might learn how to read Greek. However, if you want to learn to read to to read, speak, and understand Greek, you would need more than a grammar textbook. You would need the aural component. Most piano methods on the market today are completely reading-based. These methods can run a similar risk to Greek grammar books. They run the risk of teaching children not how to play the piano, but only to read music notation at the piano. This may result in a deficiency in their overall aural understanding of music, as well as in their ability to create their own music. That's how I was raised and I can personally attest to my poor aural skills going into college theory classes. There are extremes in the piano teaching world from teaching by rote for several years before beginning any reading instruction all the way to the other extreme of teaching only reading with no rote teaching. So we believe that in the middle is the sweet spot where visual and aural literacy are both developed. This results from teaching reading through reading pieces alongside teaching other patterned pieces by rote to develop the aural abilities. Now for our fourth question about rote teaching. Are there any benefits of teaching by rote? And I'm sure you've guessed that our answer is yes, there are many benefits. And specifically, we have identified 10 benefits of rote teaching, which we will share with you now. The first benefit to rote teaching is motivation. Rote pieces are typically much more exciting to beginning students than reading pieces. Because the keyboard patterns are easy to understand, students can play motivating music from the first lesson. For instance, in Hungry Herbie Hippo, playing using finger two only, students can play this pattern on the black keys. <laughs> students love this piece and play it over and over at home until they master it. And it's so great for their coordination of learning to cross over their hands. We have specific teaching steps for each of our reading pieces in the teacher guides on our website. After learning the black keys, we use some flat marbles, like these, nice little flat marbles, to put on the keys to teach some sounds according to the pictures you see on the second page. For instance, if I put uh, the marbles on F and B and my fingers on E and C, I can skip over the marbles and play the piece in the key of C. And finally,
finding where the marbles go and where the fingers go helps students um, learn about the keyboard orientation as well. So we'll show you a video of, of a, a little student playing a few of these improv uh, transpositions. wondering how students remember the rote pieces when they go home to practice. In general, we have found that students easily remember the patterns because they make sense to them. But if they need a reminder at home, we have reminder videos for each of the rote pieces on, on in our books on our website so students can look it up. Um, so this is an example of a reminder video, which is basically a mini tutorial on how to play the piece. To play Hungry Herbie Hippo on the black keys, I use my finger two starting on a group of three black keys, and my left hand is only going to play this one key. It's going to stay right there and just play that one, and the right hand is the one that does the moving. I go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, and again. Etc. So it's a close up, so the students are able to see the keyboard very closely like a lesson review. So the second of our 10 benefits of rote teaching is concentration. Rote pieces are generally much longer than a beginning's very short reading pieces. And so they help students divide, develop their concentration. I Love Coffee is a rote piece found at the beginning of Repertoire Book One. And uh, it was originally in Carolyn Schock's um, Method Piano Partners and she gave permission to use it in our method as well. It is composed in six variations, and it takes a great deal of concentration for a young student to play the entire uh, piece straight through without losing their focus, all six parts. In the video that we will show you today, each variation was assigned to an individual student because they all wanted to play I Love Coffee on their recital. That would have been way too much coffee. Um, so the students all knew the piece in entirety, but this video shows the ensemble version. <laughs> Our next benefit now, which is confidence. Students who learn by rote memorize pieces readily. Um, they can walk up to any piano they meet and have a piece ready to play. So they'll never be stuck saying, I don't have my book, but they can just sit down and they can play. Um, so this fun piece called Crocodile in the Nile by Wendy Lynn Steve Stevens even has a surprise at the end when the student gets to come down with their forearm and make um, a big roar at the end to represent um, the bear giving the crocodile a little scare. But I will play you the piece 
And also notice how patterned it is with the white and black key groups. go easy on your ears there and I did a pianissimo roar <laughs> with my forearm. Um, so that piece, it's a quick learn uh, for most students and they really enjoy it. So let's move to our next benefit, which is uh, keyboard orientation. So students are learning these pieces by rote and they're noticing the relationship of patterns to the keyboard directly and getting to know how to move around the piano. So Dandelion Fluff is a lyrical rote piece with a pentatonic sound. At this point of study, students are still working on playing with non-legato technique. We do that for the first two thirds of the book almost, of repertoire book one that is. So as students play this, they actually lift in the air slightly between each black key. It looks like this. And this technique actually fits in quite nicely with the theme of the piece. As students can imagine, the fluffy white dandelion seeds floating buoyantly in the air. So we have an audio track so you can hear this with the duet. So we'll play a bit of that for you. So before I talk about the next benefit, I just wanted to mention that I do see some questions coming into the Q&A and the chat, and I promise we will address those um, at the end. So let's move on to the fifth benefit, um, which is pattern recognition and form. Martians Come to Town is a rope piece that we also sell actually as an individual sheet, which you see pictured here. And you can get this as a digital download on your website, on our website. It's composed with repeating patterns and a distinct form, uh, which is shown by those <clears throat> multicolored Martians there at the bottom of the page. So for example, the first line would be the green Martian theme, which is this. And every time that line comes back in the piece, it's shown by the green Martian. Um, so that's how the, the, it works. The students actually learn each Martian or each line individually, and then they memorize them um, in order and put it together to form the piece. On our website, you can download these little colored Martians uh, for free and cut them out. So another way to make it more creative is for students to actually mix up the order of the Martians and play the piece with a different form. So this is to teach students that music isn't composed uh, randomly, but it has a pattern to it. It has a formal structure. So here is a little video of my daughter playing Martians Come to Town when she was about four and she was very new to the piano. a cute little Martian. Okay, so our sixth benefit of rote teaching is rhythm. This piece from Diversions Book One by composer Juan Cabeza uh, focuses on uh, rhythm in this one and different intervals. And Juan's compositions typically focus on one specific music 
or technical or theoretical concept. So although this piece may sound difficult, it is just blocked intervals with a syncopated rhythm. And it perfectly exemplifies the point that rhythmic development is enhanced by rote teaching. It is very easy to decode and play either by rote or by what we call quasi rote, which means playing with some reference to the score as students progress in their study. We draw attention to the patterns and how they relate to what they're seeing on the score when we teach by quasi rote. So here the syncopated rhythm may be difficult to decode from the notation, but the students are able to listen to it first and easily pick up the rhythmic structure. So here is a student playing uh, diversion 16. benefit of rote teaching is technique. Technical concepts are best taught by rote, and I'm sure we've all taught scales and other patterns by rote. Teachers play the correct gesture or articulation, and then the student imitates that. When students are not distracted by the score at the first introduction of a specific technique, they can focus solely on the motions of their hands, arms, and fingers. Monsters on the Run from Piano Safari Repertoire Book 2 uh, focuses on refining staccato technique and combining it with tenuto with a small wrist roll. So I'll play this for you without the repeat. if students have been taught from the very first lesson by rote that by this point they easily pick up these patterns and this piece can be taught in about seven minutes flat in a lesson because they're so used to learning by pattern. The eighth benefit of rote teaching is reading. It may seem paradoxical that rote teaching helps students learn to read, but we have found this to be true for two reasons. First, technique. Because students have become so adept at playing many different types of kinds of technical motions all over the keyboard, they are able to focus solely on reading rather than having to contend with the physical difficulties of playing as well. Second, patterns. Because students have learned from the beginning of study that music is composed in logical patterns, they automatically look for these patterns when they're reading. Skip to My Lou is a student-student duet that is composed with many patterns. For example, although the student cannot yet understand all the notation, they can recognize the repeating pattern of C's and G's in the left hand of the secondo part. We have four C's, four G's, four C's, two G's, and then two C's, and then they repeat. Finding patterns like this helps the student to understand that reading notation relates directly to what they play on the piano, and as reading skill improves, the identification of these patterns helps them to learn pieces with more speed and ease. In the primo part, it's completely based on patterns of thirds. Hand shifts down to three on D, and it's the same pattern of thirds. Um, so they're looking for those patterns as they read as well as in this rote piece. I'm always on the lookout for pattern pieces in any repertoire series outside of Piano Safari as well, um, because teaching these pieces is great for transfer students who might be lacking in their reading skills and we want to give them motivating sounding easy pattern music to play. So uh, this piece Celebration by Anne Crosby Gaudet is one of my go to pieces because it's so patterned. Lots 
lots of fifths patterns. Her music is available on her website. So moving on to our ninth benefit, which is the development of artistry. When a student learns a piece away from notation, it's often easier for them to focus on listening. In Rainforest Mystery, the teacher models a small section and then the student will copy the tone, the phrasing, and the dynamics. And we picked this piece to share with you specifically, if, if, as you look at the score, you can see how many dynamic changes there are um, and how much opportunity um, to teach how to play softly with good tone, for example. So I'll play you this piece. So hopefully you could hear some of my dynamics over Zoom. Um, I know I'm having a little bit of internet connection trouble, probably because of the winter storm. <laughs> but this is a fun one to try to work on with your students to get a lot of contrast and sound and to have them model that retard at the end of the piece and really take their time with it. So let's move on to our last benefit, which is creativity. For beginners, we also often have them relate sounds on the piano to sounds in nature. In this piece, outer space, the space part is taught by rote, the part that's notated there. And then the student draws pictures of things in outer space to improvise. So the part that's written out, um, we call the space theme. Let's say the student drew a picture of um, twinkling stars. So they add their improvisation there and then come back and play the space theme. Oops. Again. So the piece is actually constructed with um, a section they learn by rote and then something they get to improvise on freely. Um, and use their imaginations to think of what those things might be. Um, at the end, I didn't play it for you, but we have a shooting star glissando on the black keys, um, which is usually every child's favorite thing to do. <laughs> so um, this is a piece actually in repertoire book one, right from the beginning of study. So I wanted to go ahead and show you um, a piece that my son composed when he was four. <laughs> When my children were very small, Julie and I lived in Athens, Ohio for a while in the same town as we wrote Piano Safari Level 2. And on occasion, Julie very graciously watched them while my husband and I were at work. So she caught my son improvising one day and um, had her phone there and so she got it on video. And as I said, he was around four at the time. And he had just been working on the previous piece I played you, which was Outer Space. Um, with all of the black key glissandos and improvisation. So as you watch his um, improvisation slash composition here, notice the connections between the overall sound he's using, the theme, and the use of glissandos. We've often found that children use patterns they learn in their rope pieces to modify and then adopt as their own. And um, as you see here, rocket ship going up to space, notated, um, was a very long project poor Julie did just to um, kind of you know, please my son so he could see his sounds and what they looked like written out, but it was a little bit tricky to notate as you might expect. Um, so uh, go ahead and enjoy a little of his improvisation. This is um, Wapik Chet going up. Rocket ship going up. 
two spades, okay. So here's one more example of creativity from two sisters who were studying in Piano Safari Level 2. And they had just learned a rote piece that used harmonic fifths in 3-4 meter called Flamingo Dancers, which sounds like this. There at the beginning of the piece. And then the following week, they came to their lesson with a duet that they composed themselves. So notice how the patterns and meter of the rote piece Flamingo Dancers influenced their composition here. So I'll show you the first half. Um, they actually switch places um, after they've played through it once, so they each get an equal chance to play the primo and the secondo, which was also really cute. So in summary, our new paradigm for road teaching is meant to wipe out Noah Webster's definitions and replace them with a meaningful and effective approach to road teaching at the piano. Road teaching is meant to teach certain musical and technical ideas and allow the students to explore many styles of music and many different types of sounds at the piano. Road teaching should be used with beginners based on keyboard patterns. Remember that not every piece is a good road piece at the student's playing level and use simultaneously with instruction and reading notation. But if you're interested in teaching by rote and you haven't really got your feet wet with that, haven't tried it, um, we actually have two supplement books called Pattern Pieces 1 and 2 and these can be used with any method and what they are, um, they contain rote pieces from our repertoire books. So only the rope pieces. So you can add it to any method and any other reading approach that you would like. So please contact us if you have questions after the presentation. As I mentioned, we're going to take some right now, but um, my email is info at pianosafari.com. And then you can visit our website um, here, pianosafari.com. We have lots of resources and essays and videos and all kinds of things um, that you can dig into if you want. Um, to read more information um, and watch more videos about road teaching. So I think I'll have Julie end the screen share here and let me pull up the Q&A first. All right, so Julie, maybe we could just go back and forth and answer some of these questions that people have posted. Do you want to take the first one about Alphabet Boogie in the Q&A? Sure. The question from Petra Ruth, is why do you ask students to play alphabet boogie with just one finger? Why, what if the student wants to play with another finger like the thumb? Well, um, we originally thought we'd have students begin with finger three, which seems like the logical choice because it's in the middle of your hand. But um, we asked all the children and they all preferred finger two. 
we've actually never had someone ask to play with the thumb. So finger two seems to be the mo most natural finger to play this with. And at the beginning, we want to focus on getting their forearm motion going because the large muscles of the arm should come before refining the muscles of the finger. So we have them play um, from the forearm with finger two, which is the most comfortable finger. Um, and also we have them play with a loose fist because if they start with an open hand, they could end up with all sorts of weird hand positions. So um, if your student naturally has a good hand position, you might have them play with an open hand, but we found that it works best to have a loose fist. And then very soon into their study in just a couple of weeks, they're already opening up their hand into the piano hand shape. So moving to the next question from Kathy, um, she says, this all sounds and looks great, but she's still teaching online and probably will not return to in-person teaching. Um, duets seem to be essential for all of this, teaching by rote, and they're difficult online, so any workarounds. And I saw another question come up about just in general rote teaching while online, which so many of us are encountering, and Julie and I have been doing also. Um, so yes, it can be quite successful. It may not be quite as easy, <laughs> admittedly, but it's, it definitely can be um, possible. So first, in terms of duets, I've done a couple things. Um, one is after a student has a piece well learned, um, we do have audio accompaniment tracks that they can download. So they're like MP3s um, and they can learn to play along with those at home. Um, they have to be able to keep a very steady beat, obviously, <laughs> which is also a good skill to develop. But, um, but then if you're trying to play with them online, um, I've had um, the student mute themselves so um, that I'm not trying to follow them, but they, they can hear me. So then I give a count off and I play my part and then they follow me. And then I, they turn themselves off mute and we talk about how it went. Um, so obviously the problem with this is the teacher gets no feedback about how they actually did, but I have experimented with that um, for duet playing somewhat. Um, Julie, do you have any tips on just rote teaching in general and not really related to the duets, but just inter actually introducing a piece online? Yeah, um, I've actually had good success with having them watch the reminder video first the, the, before we do it at the lesson. Um, not that they're going to learn the piece from the video, but just to give them an idea of what we're going to do. And then I have a setup where I have my, my computer like set up like this so they can see the side view. And then I have my phone in an overhead um, stand so that they can see a close up of my hands and then I just teach it just like in the regular lesson in small sections and then have them copy. Um, and I also do the same thing with duets as Catherine does put the student on mute one, two, three, four, we play. I hope they're with me. <laughs> and then we talk about it afterwards. And we also have many of our books on SuperScore, which is on the iPad and, and um, students are able to play with the accompaniments that way as, as well. Yeah. So the next uh, question is, why do children tend to play in chromatic patterns? Uh, I think it's just because they like to play every single key <laughs> and it happens to be the chromatic pattern. So I've just noticed we've noticed that in student after student, even the little ones will doodle around with the chromatic pattern. So that's why so many of our rote pieces are chromatic. Um, so Julie, you had mentioned SuperScore just a moment ago and someone asked what SuperScore is, so maybe we can talk about that briefly. Um, SuperScore is a free app um, that you can get for an iPad. And then once you own the app, you can look um, for music by different publishers and actually download entire volumes of their music. So we have Piano Safari books such as Repertoire Book 1 and 2 and, and many other, other supplements on SuperScore. If you download that, you'll be able to view just a plain PDF of the piece, but then you also get the super score version, which is um, basically like a play along track. So the student will see the music and there'll be a bar to help them follow it. Um, and then you can hear the accompaniment. The student can hear their own part. You can even choose for the student to mute their own part or mute the accompaniment. So it's very flexible as to what they're hearing when they're playing with it. And the other great thing is you can speed up and slow down the tracks. Um, so they can practice at a certain speed and then they can um, play it more quickly once they've learned it. SuperScore is a free um, app, um, but then you would purchase the volume once you are in the app. So 
um, that is how it works. And we should do another webinar on SuperScore and show you, show you how um, it all functions. It's really handy and um, kids like to practice with it and they get to use their iPad. <laughs> so. so here's another question about using the songs, songs the children already know as a rote piece. Um, we find that a lot of these songs that they already know like are, are great singing um, songs, but not necessarily great playing on the piano songs because they don't have patterns. They have more complicated melodies. So um, they don't really have the patterns that we're going for because we don't want rote teaching to be, oh, like play, play finger one, now play th three, now play two, now it goes up to five, you know, random notes that might make a nice melody but are not patterns. So that's why our uh, rote pieces are a little bit different, um, differently constructed than an average children's like nursery song. Um, and, uh, and then there's one of, oh, going off go of ahead. that, Julie. Um, yeah, so I wrote teaching is different than playing by ear. So that's a question we get quite a bit also. Road teaching, students are modeling the teacher and they may have heard the piece before. We want them to have heard the piece before. So their ears help, but they're actually learning by watching the teacher and memorizing the patterns and understanding the patterns. Um, I do teach by ear um, when students are a little bit older, like if they want to play a piece that they know, um, like, a, let's say a Disney tune or something like that. Um, when they're older, I'll have them figure out the right hand melody by ear, and then I actually teach them to harmonize using theory um, and teach them how to add a left hand accompaniment pattern. And so we feel like that is a, another skill that's very important, but it's not what we mean by teaching by rote in the elementary levels. Here's a question about helping dyslexic students. Um, I'll never forget at a conference, I think it was NCKP several years ago, I went to a lecture on uh, teaching dyslexic students and the presenter was dyslexic herself. So that was very helpful. And she basically laid out teaching by rote. She wasn't calling it that, but she was talking about teaching them the patterns on the keyboard first and then relating that to what's on the score so they could feel what they're doing and then relate that to the score rather than we usually do the opposite, which is take the score and decode it and then transfer it to the piano. So that might be a small key on how to help dyslexic students. But one of the benefits of this kind of teaching is because if, if your dyslexic student is only reading, doing everything by reading, that can get a little bit frustrating and overwhelming. So the rote pieces provide a nice break where they can just play the piano and have results. So combining both, we feel like the combination of both really helps a lot of special needs students, but we also feel like it's vital for all students, um, neurotypical and otherwise, to in this way, to develop both their ears and their visual literacy. So I think something I've seen as a thread in some of these questions um, are, when you teach reading and how long does road teaching go on? So. We want to clarify that in Piano Safari, we do introduce reading at the same time as the uh, rote learning. So we don't really delay reading. Um, in Repertoire Book 1, we do have a unit that's an introduction where there's more rote pieces. And at that point, they're learning basic things that they'll need to read, like finger numbers and rhythm notation. Um, but, but really, we start it basically simultaneously from the beginning of study. We haven't found that students are disappointed in their reading pieces. Um, that was another question. Just because you know the rope pieces do, in general, sound much more interesting rhythmically and in terms of their um, harmonies. But um, sometimes we'll have students who will play one of their reading pieces on a recital because that's the one they love to play. <laughs> you know, so it's hard to predict exactly um, what children will like. But we haven't really found it to be a major problem that the reading pieces are easier than the rope pieces. And in Piano Safari, we continue uh, official rote pieces through level two. And when students enter repertoire book three, we feel that their reading level has caught up to their rote level. Um, they've been working on reading skills for several years. And in level three, we don't have official rote pieces. And this is not to say that we'll never teach them anything by rote again. Um, there's always times where you could use that um, like especially if you want students to work on a certain technique or a sound but we don't have official row pieces um, starting in level three right um so the 
making the reading pieces interesting. It's such a different feel for them to learn to read that that's interesting in itself. And also our accompaniments add the interest as well. So you sound like fully formed pieces um, with the teacher accompaniments. Yes. Um, one question about the improvisation part of outer space, do the student, do the student playing in tempo while improvising? That's a great question. So they're not. <laughs> Anything goes at this point in their study in terms of improvisation. We just want to encourage free exploration of the keyboard. So we can suggest certain things, like I had a student the other day who incidentally, at the end of her lesson, I'm like, well, let's just do this thing quick before you have to go. And she said, what? It's time to go already? I feel like I've been here for like five minutes. I wish I could stay longer. <laughs> she was so excited. And she's actually working on outer space. And so she did moon music and she she's a little bit of a hesitant improviser. So I suggested some um, patterns like just flat sounds with the hands. And um, she came up with some notes, just random notes with her finger twos. And then the second one was a Martian. So by that point, she was really into it. And she was just like, I said, do you think Martian would be high or low or in the middle? She's like, in the middle, it's like this <laughs> or something. So um, we try to just encourage that creativity and not try to say, no, a Martian wouldn't sound like that. Or you have to play in rhythm at this point, because that's not the goal of this piece many other pieces they'll be playing in rhythm with us but um, not in this improv improvisation that was a good question mm -hmm. these are some great questions i love how varied yeah. they are <laughs> no. do you find that using the piano safari method takes a longer time than a normal reading lesson um, so it might and um, we do have lots of different types of activities improvisation technique reading wrote um, theory. There's so many good things to work on. And Julie and I both tend to only do 45 minute lessons. Um, just because of this, I don't like to rush the process, like especially if a student's really getting into something and they're really focusing well, you don't want to feel like you instantly have to jump to something else. So I feel like it gives us a more relaxed time to work on um, all the different elements of the lesson. But with that said, if you only have 30 minutes, it can definitely be done. Yeah, and we divide the lesson up into segments. So we might spend five minutes on technique and then 10 minutes on sight reading cards or other, a new reading piece, and then 10 minutes on a rope piece or five minutes just introducing part of a rope piece. So it's not a long process. Like to teach Charlie Chipmunk, one of the first rope pieces in the book takes about five minutes or less for them to learn the whole song. Because basically the way we teach it is, here's the first part. <laughs> Then they copy that. When they get that, we say, here's an effort. They copy that. And then we put the little sections together. So it really doesn't take very much time to teach a rope piece at all. Um, Cheryl had several comments and a question. Uh, she said her students can hardly wait to play I Love Coffee Ensemble on her recital. That sounds great. Um, glad your students are having a recital there. And, playing. and she said she teaches Rainbow Fish by Catherine Rollin as a rope piece. And it has two patterns. The first is an alternating left hand white keys with right hand black keys. That is a great rope piece, very patterned, Rainbow Fish. Another one that's great as a rope piece is Storms on Saturn in Favor Love One. One's actually much easier to learn by rote than it is to read the notation. So, and it sounds much more stormy. You can work on the artistry if teaching that piece by rote. Um, and then Cheryl asked if we could talk a bit about Piano Safari Friends. How do you determine if a student should use the Friends course or is ready for level one? So Piano Safari Friends is our new method that we just released um, last year in 2021 um, for preschoolers. It's eight, designed for ages four through six. And then the regular Piano Safari level one follows the Friends course, follows on their development, um, or you can start them right in level one and it's geared for ages six through nine or 10. Um, so we would actually probably err on the side of caution. Uh, even our six-year-olds can take a run through Piano Safari Friends um, to prepare them for level one. We feel like that's one of the big benefits of, of writing the Friends series is it really lays a firm foundation in rhythm and the white key letter names um, and in different areas so that they can successfully zip through level one after that. 
Um, so it's up to you, but we would say if they're four, five, or six, they should go into friends, or if they're mature six and up, then they should go into level one, start in level one. And we actually did a webinar on Piano Safari Friends, and it is recorded. You can find it on YouTube. So if you would like to learn about all the different parts of the book and how they work, um, you can check that webinar out. Um, older student books, I've heard people mention here too. Um, yes, we have Piano Safari for the older student, which we just loosely recommend for students older than 10. But of course, it really depends on your 10 year old. Um, as a teacher, you should make the final call on if you think that 10, 10 or 11 year old is ready for the first book or the older student. It does move at an accelerated pace, but we still have rote pieces, technique and reading pieces. So it's based on the same uh, philosophy as our method for children. Um, also, I wanted to mention that on our YouTube channel and on our website are many other uh, videos of um, some of the rote pieces and also what we call instructional videos, which show us teaching some of the steps for some of these pieces. So if you're new to rote teaching, you can look up the instructional videos um, to see about the pacing and the different steps that we would use in teaching some of the pieces. There are also some semi-edited um, full lessons. Uh, I know that there's one of the very first lesson of me teaching a little boy, um, and it was a 45 minute lesson, but I edited it down to 20 minutes, just so you can see sort of the activities we would use in a very first piano safari lesson, um, and how quickly he picks up on the rote pieces and some of the ideas here. So let's finish with the question about what students would go into after they finish uh, the first three levels of Piano Safari. So um, we, both Julie and I are kind of on the same page with this. We do like to put them in um, like the RCM Celebration Series or Masterwork Classics. So some kind of classical anthology series after level three. Um, and then we like to use some kind of um, sight reading supplement like four star sight reading and ear training um, with all this said we are actually working on um, a piano safari series which we call for the advancing pianist um, that will be for students after piano safari level three so right now we're working on a technique book and a sight reading book that would come um, for students who graduate from level three and actually those will be released this year um, maybe by summer um, we're kind of putting the finishing touches on them now Yes. Um, and eventually we'll have repertoire anthologies also. Um, I'm kind of a repertoire nerd and just love reading through all the music I can get my hands on. So uh, working towards that, but that'll be several years in the future. Um, so right now we do use Masterwork Classics or the Celebration Series. Also, I'll, um, I like to supplement with many of the educational composers like Kevin Olson has a book called Preludes in Patterns, which I give to all my level three or just after level three students. It's a wonderful book. Martha Mir, Just Imagine book one and two. I use those a lot. Um, so Dennis Alexander, I love much of his music. So any books that are from your favorite composers combined with classical music, combined with continuing to teach scales and then um, more sight reading. I've also been experimenting with um, teaching more duets as sight reading. I call it on the spot sight reading at the lesson for my intermediate students. So we, we sight read uh, really easy duets that have a teacher accompaniment because what's the point of learning to sight read well it's so that when you're on your practice break at midnight in the practice room at college you can play you can sight read mozart piano sonatas with your best friend right that's what i did so that uh, i had a student who's new and he's in sixth grade and the other day i said let's do on the spot sight reading here we go and he's like yay so <laughs> we're off on a good foot with um him loving sight reading so uh, the, I, I use a lot of the pieces from the Masterwork Classics duets, levels one and two for that on the spot site reading uh, by Jane McGraw. So um, kind of a mishmash after level three or older student level three, but we are working on having some more books at, in at that level. Yeah. All right. So um, Julie, do you mind typing in the chat just a few of the resources that you mentioned there of things that sure. you post level three, we got a question on that. I'm going to pick this for everyone. Post 
I'm going to mute myself because I know you can all hear me typing. All right. And while she's doing that, I'm going to talk about um, Julie Cooper asked about giving group lessons, two or three at the piano. Any tips apart from them playing together, getting the stronger ones to demo sometimes, keeping them all engaged, et cetera. I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> We're actually um, doing a presentation at MTNA on group teaching. So it's called Groups and Games. Um, that'll be on Pedagogy Saturday, which is now virtual. Um, so if you're attending that conference, then you will hear us talk quite a bit about group piano teaching. Um, and we will try to do that as a webinar later after MTNA. It's such a great topic. Um, it's difficult to teach a group well. I'm experiencing this because I teach a group at Ohio University of four and five year olds. I've got five of them in my class. Um, so I'm using Piano Safari Friends with them and it's actually a blast. Um, but I have to think through every single step of that group lesson to make it flow smoothly, that is for sure. <laughs> so, so I promise we will dive into that um, later. Yes. All right. All right, thank you everybody just for your kind comments and for sticking with us um, all the way through this webinar um, and for all your great questions. So if there is anything that we did not answer today, I'm sorry we missed it, um, please email me at info at pianosafari.com. And then we'll also make this presentation available again on Teaching Piano Safari on Facebook, um, or you can email me and I'll send you the link for the recording. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you all. everybody. Hope you enjoy your weekend. Yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs>